This Restorative Justice Life is a production of Amplify RJ. Follow us on all social media platforms at Amplify RJ. Sign up for our email list and check out our website at AmplifyRJ.com to stay up to date on everything we have going on. Make sure you're subscribed to this feed on whatever platform you're listening on right now so you don't miss an episode. And finally, we'd love it if you left us a rating and review. It really helps us literally amplify this work. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to This Restorative Justice Life, the podcast that explores how the philosophy, practices, and values of restorative justice apply to our everyday lives. I'm your host, David Ryan Barcega Castro Harris, all five names for the ancestors, and I'm the founder of Amplify RJ. On this podcast, I talk with RJ practitioners, circle keepers, and others doing this work about how this way of being has impacted their lives. Today's guest is another one of the people who taught me so much about this work when I lived in Chicago. Sandra Sosa is currently a member of the Social Justice and Wellbeing team with the W. Hayward Burns Institute, but I first got to know her as someone who embodies restorative work from an indigenous perspective. She does an amazing job at weaving ancestral teachings and rites of passage work together with modern youth development practices in her community. We never officially worked together, but I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to collaborate on initiatives in the Chicago restorative justice community. Even though I was often the youngest person in the room, I always appreciated her treating me as more than someone who could just bring in the youth perspective. And I admire her so much for fully showing up as herself, even when that meant standing out from the group. I learned so much from talking with her today, and I really hope you will too. Enjoy our conversation. Welcome, Sandra. Who are you? I am a woman. I am indigenous identified and learning. Who are you? I am someone that is really loyal. Who are you? I am a sister of many. (laughs) Who are you? I am a daughter of several. (laughs) Who are you? Um, I am a duality in training. (laughs) Who are you? I'm a student, a student of different teachings. And lastly, who are you? I am Sandra. (laughs) And we're going to get to explore lots of the things that Sandra is over the (laughs) next few moments. But before we get into that, um, especially uh, with how this last year has gone, how are you? Oh, Um, I'm going to say today I am grateful considering you know, the trials and tribulations that my family has gone through this past year, like health-wise, economically, um, but also the joys that have come through and we've been able to, you know, have been able to like pull us through all of the other things. I'm grateful that everybody's still here. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's so much perspective to take and like, Gratitude is such an important uh, piece of like doing this work and living this life well, right? Because there's always something that um, is wrong, right? Or something to struggle with. But um, there's also always beauty. Um, is that practice of gratitude something that uh, has been a part of your life for a while? Yeah, my I would I'm gonna say my grandmother is the one that really taught us. My mother's mother, um, my tita, we, we called her tita. Uh, she always you know, I don't know, this might be, I'm sure it's not just a Mexican thing, but she always made us say thanks before Mm -hmm. we ate, right? Like every meal, all the time, um, and taught us to really like just be happy with what we have. I mean, literally beans was a staple all day. So if you had beans to eat and a quesadilla, then you were all good. So I think, um, I think I would like to improve on like my practices of being grateful, but I do try to um, be very conscious. And my mother has continued that those teachings, so she reminds us all the time 
<laughs> we need to be grateful. Yeah, you know, the other Indigenous person that we've had on the podcast, um, Helen Thomas, uh, talked about, you know, not growing up knowing the word restorative justice um, from her mom. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just like, we just live in the circle way. I know you didn't know the word restorative justice growing up, uh, but from your perspective, how did you start learning this work? Yeah, I'm going to say um, didn't know what it was as a thing. All I know is I have clear recollections. We used to live my brother, my sister, and I used to live with our with our grandmother, my tita, our tita. Um, I was in kindergarten, my brother was in second grade, and my sister was not in school yet. And so we had to live with her because my mom worked day shift and my dad worked the night shift. My mom didn't drive, there was only one car. And the school was down the block from my grandmother's house. So I remember... So we, we had, I think it was like three uncles lived with us, one of them with their family um, and an aunt. And it was, it's also, it was a small house. But I remember um, when, like them having these family meetings in the basement and when people were messing up their lives, like I remember my grandmother being like the at the helm of um, helping people like, making sure they get the advice um, and the scolding that they needed to get it together. So I remember that being a thing and I remember also particularly the women like when when they gathered in the kitchen cooking and always talking about things. So like always talking about and help helping each other figure out how to solve the problem. So you know, I don't know what that, I didn't know what that was, but as I've learned um, to understand like the roots of restorative justice in just cultural uh, traditions or cultural ways, I, I can see those are probably the remnants of, you know, the adaptive remnants of what maybe used to be that practice. And it's, it's still there. It's, you know, it's just, um, it's different. It may look different, uh, but it's still there. And my mom, I can't say we've, uh, I think we've been doing that more and more because of my brother and myself. Uh, we're both kind of doing that work. Um, but, but I would say like early on, that's what I remember. And I used to not name that. I used to not acknowledge that. And and over the years, I want to make sure that I acknowledge that that was my first exposure to what that was. And then, and then still not even knowing it was restorative justice in college, when one of our um, one of my mentors, a teacher, Mike Fraga, he was the associate director of the Latino Latin American Studies program, and he. We started, he helped a, a core group of students start an organization on campus, an activist group. And um, he was the one who introduced me to Sage mm -hmm. and smudging and talking circle. So I still didn't make a connection then, but now I can see like it was the same thing. Maybe my grandmother had a rosary, but it was still the essence of like being in, in circle, being in community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like from the like early stages of your life when you you saw those things happening, um, like what were you thinking? Or is it like oh, it's like oh, adults doing adult things, like l let them do their thing. I'm gonna go play. Or is it like oh, I want to be a part of that. What's going on? I think I remember trying to sneak down the stairs to listen um, because I knew we knew that folks were getting scolded. Like we knew that our, our, our uncles, it was actually to me, I think internally, it was kind of funny because these are the uncles that wanna impose discipline on us. <laughs> and so it was nice to see them getting disciplined. Like that was my personal, um, that's so me though. Like, like, haha, like you're, you're getting scolded too. Um, so, I, but I remember like, trying to sneak down but they always heard us like hey get back upstairs you're not supposed to be here so we'd be running back upstairs um 
But yeah, I think it was um, wanting to, maybe like more wanting to be a part of it, but not knowing that I wanted to be a part of it. Just really curious about what do they do down there other than people coming up knowing, like you hearing the after talk of, you know, somebody got scolded. For sure, for sure. Was it, uh, like when you're talking about like your uncle's uh being the ones to do discipline, quote unquote discipline, right? What did that mean for you growing up? Was that the chancla or is that something more restorative? (laughs) I don't think I ever experienced them spanking us or I don't remember. Um, But it was my, (laughs) my mom's side of the family. They have this look on them. I think it's from her father's side. The Saldana's like there. My mom has the look, so you get that look. You you stop right there, like you don't push it further. So, uh, my tío Carlos uh, and my tío Juan are the ones that really have that that firmness and that intensity. My mom has that. So I don't remember them, you know. But it was the scolding. Um, I don't remember being afraid of them, though. I don't remember being afraid of them. Um, so I think it felt, it didn't feel awful. You know, I remember being afraid of my dad. I remember being so afraid, like I developed a stutter mm. because of the way my dad imposed authority um, or executed authority. But my uncles, I think they were just that. Whatever that is on that side of the family, they just had that sternness and, you know, you didn't want to push it further. <laughs> you didn't want to go further. You don't want to see what came after. <laughs> like, so growing up then, um, you had like these ideas around, you know, we talk things out. We talk out problems, right? Um, we care about our family. Um, what was the student activism around in college? So as I remember, that's, it was really, I was a very angry activist. I was like the angry activist. I was writing um, po- a lot of poetry at the time. And I don't want to say angry as in hateful. It was just like angry at the system that I was learning about, angry at not knowing my culture as much as I wanted to. It was the first time I, I was experiencing Um, Chicanismo, like what is the identity of being Chicano? Um, Because that was very new to me. Um, Though activism itself wasn't because my uncle Martin Cabrera was an activist here in Chicago. He was um, one of like the community founders of um, Casa Slan. And one of my uncles was a Brown Beret in Chicago. So, you know, like that, but the the indigenous at like the rooted part of our culture uh the indigenous rooted part of our culture i didn't know about so i felt angry i felt like why why wasn't i told and angry about the religion so i had a huge that was where i started um letting go of my catholic upbringing though i've never i'll say i've never um felt the need to be disrespectful towards my Catholic upbringing because my fam- majority of my family is Catholic, Mexican Catholic at that. So, um, but I remember being angry about like, why didn't I know about these traditions or these practices, these ceremonies? Why didn't I learn about Copal? Why didn't I, you know, so it was a lot of that self-identity. Um, and then gender roles, like assumed gender roles in in the Catholic tradition, male, female. So that was a big, like me just, you know, because I never considered myself to be like the feminine type, but um, I identify as female, but I never considered myself. I always, like when I was younger, I felt like I was um, more of a tomboy type. Like I literally <laughs> would get into arguments and fights with boys like throwing boys off their bikes and stuff for for bullying my sister so i in college and and in the the campus that's pretty much it was this anger towards um 
not letting us learn about our history. And it's funny because that's very much what the 70s and yeah. the 60s was about. And um, the Chicano Studies program, the, the Chicano history class was um, cast away. Like, the, I didn't even get a chance to take it. So it was there the year before, the year that I started, but it wasn't there the year after. Um, so, I, 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 if I remember correctly. So, it was um, the campus. We were part of, like, raising that consciousness up. Um, there were Latino student organizations, like OLAS, um, Organization of Latin American Students, and there was Vale, Voz Alianza Latina Estudiantil. Um, and then there were some for some Latino fraternities and sororities, but nothing that was really, Olas had its time back in the day, um, early in its time. But at the time when we started, they were no longer the ones um, raising the issues, raising the consciousness. So uh, I think we kind of kicked up, like un unearthed all of those things and uh you know, we were part of like sit-ins and walkouts of classroom and um, workshops and cultural events and um, political events on campus. So it was like a raising of consciousness all around. Um, and internally, I was dealing with my own anger, you know, but all of us were pretty we were pretty we went to the latino latino million man march at the time like we we were part of uh crashing a bunch of knox conferences national association for chicana chicano students conferences so it was like we would just show up at these conferences we wouldn't even pay we would just which show is up one of the habits you still <laughs> traffic in not to call you out <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know every time I'm like, yeah, this is this is so typical, but um, that's where I learned it. From. <laughs> I learned it from those people in college that I will not name. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think that's what it was. It was really the time to raise those things back up and not be um, conforming to what the university wanted us to learn. And so through that, we actually got um, some really good wins as far as just the Latino Student Center um, and we brought up amazing speakers like Rigoberta Menchu from Guatemala. Um, we brought up people like um, Madres de la Plaza de Mayo from Argentina. So we were able to really infuse those times with some strong political messaging and um, those women were really strong in uh, like the from Argentina, those mothers were the ones, the mothers of the disappeared that were still coming out and, and speaking out about their their children that had or, or husbands that had disappeared in the times of the regime. And um, so that was unheard of. And I don't know if that's really happened since. So. Yeah. It was anger, but it was productive. For sure. Um, I think one of the things that I'm wondering, you talked about um, clashing with like the Chicano movement and why, can, can you explain like the difference between your perspectives as an indigenous person and, um, you know, what the Chicano movement was trying to do? Well, actually, not so much a clash. I, so the Chicano identity wasn't as popularly used here in the gotcha. Midwest. And I grew up in Chicago. So we... I would say, generally speaking, Chicano was looked upon even more negatively than it may have started on the West Coast and in the Southwest. Um, so my understanding of Chicano in the positive tense, it was a political identity of acknowledging your indigenous roots and your roots being on this side of the made up um, border, the border, we should say the made up border. And um and so finding that identity, I learned like folks that were really even pushing the the use of the term Chicano by changing the the spelling of it instead of CH using the X, which is what rooted the Nahuatl, right, our, our indigenous language to the identity. Um, so those were the things that I understood. However, if, ever since I was little, I, I always identified as Mexican. We were first generation here. My parents were from Mexico, um, are from Mexico. And so I, um, 
learn Spanish first before I learned English. And I knew all of my Mexican and Mexican Catholic ways, foods, all of that before anything else. So I didn't necessarily vibe with identifying as Chicana, but I understood it better. And um, I still think today like Midwestern, you, you, it's a, it's for me, it, I think it's a very, very much a political identity. So you make a decision on that. And I think on the, in the Southwest, it was like, that is your identity, like survival. That is who we are. It is, it is political, but I think it was like more ingrained and like, this is who we are. And in here it was more like, I'm going to choose to call myself Chicano. For sure. For sure. Um, Growing up uh, with such strong Mexican-American identity, um, was there a sense of loss that you felt not knowing like the indigenous roots that you had? I did, because I was learning um, where some of those things mm. came from. So, you know, in for example, like this is a huge thing and I, I'm not, I'm definitely not going to go into it, but the Virgen de Guadalupe, there's a strong history about and a strong debate about that symbol, mm -hmm. that image. So there's the very Catholic, you know, version of um, the Virgin, the Virgen de Guadalupe, and how she appeared to this indigenous man. And then there's the indigenous version of like um, the the use, the appropriation of indigenous symbolism in order to convert indigenous folks. And that's why that story had to come out. But the symbolism of La Virgen, all of it is very tied to many forms of uh, indigenous culture. So like, there's a lot of things. And if anybody's interested, you, you all can do the research. It's, it's big, it is, and it's not something people talk about. But for me, that was the thing. And that was what really first hurt my relationship with my mother the most. So being in college, um, towards the end, uh, almost towards the end, now I'm gonna say towards the middle, that was, a, there was a big rift between my mom and I because of me questioning religion and wanting to own more. Like, I don't wanna be, in my, in my mind, in my heart, I felt, I don't want to be feeling guilty all of my life for things that I didn't know any better. Um, I've, I mean, I'm baptized. I did my confirmation, all those things. Um, I did my communion, but I'm like, I didn't have a choice in those, right? Like I didn't know necessarily what I was doing. And so if I do something wrong, like I didn't know why I would be told I'm going to hell or I'm going to have like this, this judgment upon me. It just wasn't making sense to me anymore. I mean, I was what, 19, 20, <laughs> 21. So I was, I was making my, I was starting to question and, and making my choices. So that was the biggest part for me was like, I wish I had a choice in, um, or at least that if I was exposed to these indigenous ways, I would have felt more comfortable with um, spirituality. So I struggled for a small period of time with what spirituality meant to me and what I should adopt for myself and what I didn't want to. Um, and I guess for my mom, it felt like I was becoming an atheist in her mind, you know? And, and so that to me was the biggest thing about, I wish I would have learned these ways because I since then since I've practiced more since I've learned more I do feel a deeper sense of a spiritual belonging and peace for myself and connection to others I can be in a room with other people from different religions and I don't feel like I have to challenge them and I don't feel threatened right. by anybody else yeah, then what does your spiritual practice look like now <laughs> um baking no i'm just kidding <laughs> um so pre-pandemic <laughs> um 
right now i would say what i am what what i what i practice in in um for myself are like my my gratitude um my medicine burn so whatever medicine i use whether it's sage or whether it's copal um doing that when you know like cleansing our home um cleansing ourselves um our for for myself just using that more as um my way of meditation and guidance and centering um i use it uh we my our union ceremony was in our uh, traditional and at least my traditional uh way so we had um we had a union ceremony rooted in mexican indigenous ways and it was run by my our maestro um akashi yotzin so it was very um from start to finish my whole family was their first time having to experience my spirituality or or our spirituality marcos and mine so it was uh so that that was being more open has also been part of my practice of like not feeling like i have to shy away or like i can't name things um but i would say more so um the the med- the meditation and or the cleansing or or sitting with with um with fire is my way of mm-hmm. of centering and grounding reflecting i have to do a lot of reflecting to keep me from reacting and sometimes when i don't do the reflecting i just rah, like i'm just like a dragon um or a really <laughs> a really loud chihuahua <laughs> um annoying but yeah so i think that's that's been more for me it, it's on the quiet side and then community wise um i do a, i do practice um the nipi ceremony or some people know as the sweat lodge um the mascal and i have uh and then we do go to um what we call like not seasonal but um sol- solstice type equinox type of um ceremony and ritual uh that are rooted in um mexica tradition so do practice in those things and honoring or observing um certain certain times around the year to uh honor the change of uh the external change which represents the internal change so winter solstice for some for us would be like the time of of um the warrior within to be born and to start to uh to start to build like our capacity and will which is you know very uh very small we we associate it with like the sun in the winter is really small because it fly it's the lowest it's, there's less daytime and so for us that represent that's represented by like the hummingbird um and the hummingbird is repre- represents our inner warrior and it's may- maybe little very little but it's has a huge will to live and um and is super bright with its color so it just there's a lot going on there and i think for me those things are what help me those that thinking those symbolism and those practices are what keep me um more positive and um seeing things as more precious and has really uh lifted up what my where i was in terms of not considering myself to uh adopt any spiritual practice is seeing more things that are represented in in beauty and in nature so it sounds like a lot of that got started for you in college how did you continue to develop that i'm learning that like sometimes people you know people come into your life for a reason and you don't you may not be with them for very long um so i met quite a few people in college that i didn't necessarily see all the time but after meeting them kind of sent me wanting to seek put myself in spaces and places where eventually i would be connecting to more people like that and uh when i left college i felt like 
it's gone. Like I'm not going to be in those spaces anymore because all those people were through, were connected through my experiences there. But when I came back here, um, I was connected with, uh, by, because these folks, the YSS, Youth Struggling for Survival, they showed up at a conference we had in, um, mm -hmm. at NIU. I went to Northern Illinois and they were challenging us because they're like, who are all these brown beret wearing, you know, and we were the ones wearing the brown berets. It was like our nod to the Black Panther Party, the American Indigenous, um, the American Indian Movement, the Young Lords and the Brown Beret. So that was our reason. And so they challenged us. So when I never thought I'd see them again, but I ended up being introduced to um, Frank Blasquez, Lou Blasquez, um, his, his, um, his Hassani, and their daughter, Natane, and Frank, their son. And so this whole community mm -hmm. with Luis Rodriguez, the author, I didn't know he was a part of, Pat Zamora, um, and um, Camila Thompson. So like this circle of adults was what connected me to this bigger world of, they were doing talking circles, they were doing ceremony, and I didn't realize like, wow. And then I was also connected to people like Tomas and Adan and um, by, you know, at the time I made friends with um, Alma and uh, she was the one who really was connected to all these communities. So I found myself meeting people that connected me to those spaces. And so now, like, I am very grateful for being in those communities. And now, like, I'm a part of that, you know, like I, those people are family to me. Um, and had it not been for the experiences of you know, showing up at conferences and just, you know, crashing them and meeting people. I don't know. I don't know where I could have been. Right. But it was because of those things like, oh, we want to go see this elder. We're going to have to drive to Minnesota, St. Paul and go see him and get money from the student union to, to go drive, get a van and stay in a hotel. And man, those are crazy times. But if it were not for that, I wouldn't be knowing the people that I know and I wouldn't be the person that I am along from alongside like what my parents taught me um, my mom my grandma I wouldn't be who I am so so yeah I think it was those seeds in college that really led me to the the connection that I have and and also you because I met Cheryl through meeting Pablo through being in college and like so like those are the people and I wouldn't have met you, I don't think, if I wouldn't have known Cheryl. You happened to be at Alternatives mm -hmm. um, after after I was there. So to me, it's just, it's all connected. Yeah, for sure. Like, so like, you've definitely been like growing in your, in your spiritual practice, as we all do over the years. Um, but in college, um, you studied, I'm on your LinkedIn, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you studied like, um, things that don't necessarily have to do with what you're doing now. Almost all of your work uh, since you've left college has been with youth, um, and yet you studied English. <laughs> well, so it's, it's actually the things that I studied in my English major. So I mm -hmm. took courses like multicultural um, literature, domestic violence literature, um, Native American literature, uh, I don't remember. I want to say it was LGBTQ literature at the time because our the there was a the only well maybe not the only maybe the only PhD uh teacher professor um Ibis Gomez Vega who was um who's lesbian and she was Cuban <laughs> and so awesome. Um she was freaking she was amazing. Uh, she taught all of those classes. So I literally, there was a, like three of us followed her through all her classes. So she was the one who really exposed us to learning. Um, there was like a multicultural literature taught me, exposed me to Arab culture and, and authors and um, a whole a whole lot of different. Then I took Latino Latin American studies as a minor, but that exposed me to some sociology. So learning... Um, 
learning about like race, class, and gender, and re- learning about some social, you know, social structures. So it was, you know, it doesn't appear <laughs> like there was any roots, but I initially wanted to be a philosophy, um, a psychologist when I first started, mm-hmm. and I took intro to psych, and I said hell to the no that's not what I want to do (laughs) and then I went into English um, because I've always loved literature and I love writing I haven't written in a while but that was the the women's studies minor uh, allowed me to take a lot of cultural classes as well and a lot of those um, so they really helped formulate my political framework in many ways in the women's studies, I was one of, of a handful amidst hundreds and hundreds of um, students. I was one of a handful of the Latinas or women of color in the classroom. So interestingly enough, we always made really good relationships with the professors who many times asked us to speak in their classrooms about our experiences as women in modern day culture. So. So it did shape a lot. And what I found there was, there was definitely a need um, for race relations, community relations, um, which is why it made so much sense for me to, uh, when I came out of college, I went into after school programming. Mm -hmm. And what I liked about that was the youth, um, the children and the youth, like they were my teachers. They were literally, my first day, one of them said, you're not going to be here longer than three months. He's like, nobody cares. Nobody ever stays long enough to care. And you don't tell that to somebody like me because then you're like, oh, man, I'm I'm here forever now. Like, that's why I say I'm loyal because now I'm stuck here. And I loved those kids. Like, man, th- that was my that was my crew. That was my tribe. Um, there were like sixth through eighth graders that I worked with. So what I learned in college through my studies was like all led me towards working with different cultures and working within different cultures, understanding different cultures and wanting to be working in the community. So it's funny how that played out. Yeah, definitely. I, well, I was one laughing because I was a psychology major going into college as well. Um, I lasted a full year. <laughs> um, I, I liked intro to psych. Um, and like when I started taking the, more of the classes, I was like, mm, no, maybe not. So the path is definitely not linear. But I also appreciated you talking about how like, you know, um, well, one, like the path's not linear. Uh, it's... Um, but like all the experiences you have along the way uh, put you in the situations that you're in. Because if I was to, before having this conversation, if I was to just look back on like what I thought your path was, like I knew it was just like a lot of youth work, but um, it's so interesting to see like how you got there. Um, you've been doing youth work for almost all of your professional career uh, in some way, shape or form, right? You're not always working directly with youth, right? Um, but what is it about that, that, um, um, energizes you? Oh man, that's just my heart. So when I went into English, I decided I want to be a teacher. And then I realized I don't want to teach in the Chicago public school. (laughs) Like it's it's something (laughs) like always said, no, no, no. You want to do that, but not that. But here's the thing. When I was little, and I have a cousin that will attest to me being an, a just a dictator and a bully, because I always made her be my student. Like, I always wanted to play the teacher. I was always trying to be, like, the teacher. So I knew there was something in me that wanted to facilitate knowledge and share, or information and share. Um, so when I came out of college, and I saw, I, th- I was looking for a job several places, and I wanted to try I don't know what draw me drew me to but being in after school and I thought well I also have a long history of babysitting my cousins <laughs> when they were little and um, a lot of them are like definitely more than um, at least 10 years younger than me so my sister and I did a lot of babysitting um, but I realized like 
this is like teaching. This is a form of teaching and I get to be creative. I don't have to like be held down by the rigidity of, of CPS. So that was my first uh, realizing like, oh, I'm going to give this a try. And then that young person that told me that, um, I think he was in sixth grade. And working with that group, um, I was with uh, Casa Central. That was my first job. And um, Suzanne was my my boss. And she was younger than me. But I, I can say she was a great mentor in how she taught us to appreciate like the after-school way of life. Um, she had lots of great practices. Um, you know, we probably bumped heads a couple times because I still didn't know all that I was doing. But I remember like kids wanted to do something for our family nights. So this is probably my first little eye opener where they wanted to do a dance. And I was like, oh, man, I don't know how to dance. <laughs> Not the way they wanted to dance. Right. But I was working in a community that was mainly like Puerto Rican, Central American, a um, little bit of Mexican in the Hermosa. Um, and so they, <laughs> they started wanting to do this like, I think we, we decided um, they wanted to do kind of a bomba style. Um, so very traditional Puerto Rican, Afro Puerto Rican. Um, and it allowed me to really see like the teaching doesn't have to come with me being in the front of the classroom, but like guiding this group of young people to, to do with, what is it that they want to do? Um, I don't remember if it was my idea or their idea. Uh, and then they wanted to do a merengue. So then they chore choreographed their own merengue group dance. And I swear, I thought you would be in a quinceañera, you know, but these kids were serious about their dancing and their music. So um, it was amazing for me to, in that experience, that first experience, um, the connections I made with working with, with young children or you or older children um, and younger youth. And then like that kind of brought me on, like, what else can I do? I was, uh, I had to leave that job because of a physical, um, situation I had. I had to get surgery on my back. And so it was very sad. It just broke my heart to have to leave, um, that job. But I was exposed to the entire youth work field through taking trainings and classes because Suzanne was pushing us to educate ourselves and improve our practice. Um, and if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have met all of the practitioners and avenues of the youth work field later on, you know. So I, I was a teacher at Alspira at Alternative High School. I taught there, which I also thought, well, I didn't want to be a teacher at a school, but Alspira was different. It's an alternative high school. I was able to teach um, poetry and coach a slam group which this is uh this was a group of students that had never been exposed to that and they were amazing right um so then it went you know set me off into essentially landing at Southwest Youth Collaborative where I worked for 10 years um running an after school program and the youth work field to me is is all of it it's community and young people because they're both one and the same and they're very uniquely different um so that and it allowed me to bring in my activism side <laughs> and my political side so in in at southwest youth collaborative we had our themes were centered around cultures every month was a different culture and we always um, try to teach them about movement, like what movements were happening in that region or that co country um, and food and cultural traditions. So it was like the perfect marriage of all the things that I had experienced and being able to share that and expose um, the youth to to those things. Yeah. And um, 
in my imagination, Southwest Youth Collaborative is where you learn the words actual like restorative justice. Am I, is that accurate? Yes. Um, not through them necessarily, but it was in that time in frame. In the time frame, yeah. Yeah. Right. The, well, so it was um, when I was in college, I was um, trained initially by CJYI to do the community panels for youth. So Community Justice Youth mm -hmm. Initiative at the time, which is now Institute, um, they were starting their community panels for youth. So that was my first experience of like where the roots of um, Cheryl's RJ work was happening there, mm -hmm. Cheryl and Aura um, and Jeffrey, Jeffrey Banks. So that was where like I was seeing those inklings. And then in, in South, while I was with SWIC, I heard about CJYI and starting restorative justice. Now, I was already with YSS and we were doing um, talking circles. I linked up with YSS while I was working at Aspira. So it was right before I started at Southwest Youth. And um, so when I, so I saw we were doing that, I remember being really upset, David, like for real. Because um, Jonathan Peck, who was also at Southwest Youth, came back from taking, I had heard about the, the trainings, the RJ trainings that, um, that that CJYI was doing. And Jonathan comes back and he's talking wonders about this three-day training or four-day training. And I'm sitting in this room with Swick, like all the staff, and I'm like, my foot is just like tapping. And I had to say something. I said... We've been doing talking circles at the after school program for over a year. And that's exactly what you just came from experiencing. And yet no one ever talks about what we do. <laughs> I mean, it was, but it was like the moment to realize how the two worlds collided of like, those that were doing the ceremonial, the ritual, the traditional way of, of doing it, and then the way it was adapted, right, to be able um, for more people to have access in, in a different capacity, right? So, but I was mad because I'm like, how dare you not acknowledge, like, the way I've been doing it with the community here, like, the way we, we have been doing it, and and make us want to take a training that you took. Like, that was real talk. Like, this is so so real for me. Um, but, I, of course, I made peace with all that. Because <laughs> I'm like, that's not what this is about. But it did, it was a real thing in terms of the tension that exists in the community, in the two communities. And that's... Uh, and the two community. Go ahead. Yeah, so, and that's how, like, restorative justice kind of came to me as the clear, like... This is restorative justice. Um, but I realized, so that's what we do, but it just, it looks different or somewhat, you know, it has maybe a different appearance, but it's the same thing. And I noticed that was the, the tension in like those two different ways of doing it. Yeah, there's something about... Um knowing uh so if for those of you who haven't listened to the very first episode of this podcast uh the guest was cheryl graves and she talks about the origins of community panels for youth and the work that she was doing mm. there with uh many other people also learning about circle from Kay Pranis and others right and uh sandra uh experienced uh that training early on right um before i haven't recorded this episode yet but it's going to air before this episode um, goes. Um, in, in my conversation with Kay Pranis, right, um, mm -hmm. her work around Circle um, didn't start with the word restorative justice, Correct. right? Um, it's how um, it's now been translated uh, for a lot of things within schools, uh, within the criminal legal system. And, uh, you know, it's not that these things are mutually exclusive, right? 
but like when people learn one way thinking like this is the capital t truth of like this is the way things need to be and then oh restorative justice is the capital t truth of the way uh, like this way works um there is tension um and you and i have been uh involved with many conversations around what that looks like yes. uh, in Chicago for like the greater quote unquote restorative justice community. Um, but just um, in general, as we're doing the work, um, is there anything from that that really stands out to you? I mean, all of it. I think um, like as I started, as I had met Tomas and, and Frank and all that, like I knew in my mind and in my heart, I knew, I knew what I knew. And I had to actually um, learn to apply what I had, what the way I had learned things in, in such a way where I would have to say, I know what I know. That doesn't mean that what I know is the only way to know, right? And so I had to learn to like, <laughs> Train, my, train myself to not fall into that pattern of thinking. I remember when I took on the manager position at um, Alternatives and our first meeting we had with um, Cheryl and Aura and they looked at me and they were like, I'm so glad you are there right now. And it didn't hit me till then that I'm like, I just took a position where Pat Zamora, who was the first person started doing talking circles at Sen High School through Alternatives, she was in that position. She started that work at Alternatives. And here I am now. And I thought, I have a responsibility. I don't know what it is yet. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Um, but with hearing them say that, I felt like that's where I needed to just let it be. Like, we are all on going in the same way. We're just, um, we might have on different shoes, but we're all going in the same way. And so, you know, there's, I'm sure there's like residue there, maybe from things that have happened when the two, the two practices or two worlds collided. Um, there's tension there now where, um, not necessarily with, with Cheryl, but um, in, in the RJ community that exists now where um, the indigenous, the folks that practice um, these traditional ways aren't necessarily at the table and don't necessarily want to be at the table sometimes because of the fracturing that has occurred over time. Um, and I think, you know, it's going to take time to like build, repair that. Uh, but I also think people maybe are, are fine with everybody. As long as everybody's doing the work, like we don't necessarily have to be in the same pot to do it. Um, but we're all cooking our way to justice. Right. So there's different ways to look at it now. And I think what, what sticks out for me is, um, not being that person anymore and um of like but you know like but uh and but my way is like the way right and, or your way mm -hmm. is not the only way right like not mm -hmm. being that person either and still being someone um that helps to center um our traditional practices, like making sure that those are present um, and respected and not because they're, you know, and not appropriate. Because another thing that's happening in Chicago, at least, is um, not, not just in Chicago, but what I've seen is there's like restorative justice in police departments, in churches and if you think about the roots of indigenous um, practices and you tie those to the roots of those practices, it's just, you know, it's very hard yeah. to accept um, that one should be taking on the other. It just, it, it's just a huge, um, what do you call it? Like a contradiction. 
Right. What what you're saying is helping me distill something that like I don't think I've ever articulated like this. When you're coming to these ways, restorative practices, circle keeping, um, from a place of this is the way that our ancestors um, were together and lived together, um, and this is the way that we want to embody um, connection in our community, that's one thing. Um, the other perspective is saying in schools, in the criminal legal system, we're doing a lot of harm. What can we do to fix it? Oh, let's take practices that we see in other places and bring them in to these white supremacist colonial systems, right? Um, and that's where like the tension lies. And it's not just white people um, who are doing that, right? Um, yeah, that that's really tough. And like we are all trying to get to justice, right? But the assumptions being made at the beginning are a little bit different. Yeah, that's a great way of summarizing that up and it's very real like and people are, will experience it different ways um and i think it's it's really it's really um up to us to be responsible with um how we walk together without hurting one another and um also sometimes letting others walk and and we support you know so like so it's not always all of us all at the same time um we all have our different strengths in different ways and i think sometimes we we think that like everyone has to shine all the time or nobody shines mm -hmm. and i don't think that's i don't believe that anymore i think it's everyone can shine and we all shine in different ways and and um at different times um and that could be a compliment that's harmonizing you know like if you think of music wise you don't have all of the singers on the same note in the same tone that's not harmony so it's okay that some are over here and some over there you have all the different tones and notes at the same time and they're all strong and they all complement and fill in the part that they need to yeah in the mid 2010s when you were uh doing where your a big part of your job was like helping bring restorative justice practices into um you know a white supremacist colonial system like cps chicago public schools like how did you navigate that tension so that was one of the reasons why i didn't want to work at alternatives initially because i'm like i don't like and i remember um I remember the conversations around from my elders around like how was it actually um, received or being practiced after Pat was um, part of like Pat Simona was part of bringing that into the school. First, it was really just with the students. It wasn't necessarily like a school policy. Um, mm -hmm. And. I believe she also worked with Cheryl and Aura in, in those ways. So I knew about, um, in some of the trainings I took at Harold Washington for youth development, um, Edith Krigler came in and she did a workshop. Uh, they brought her in to do a restorative justice workshop. And I remember seeing like five or six things in the center that um, she named as you could choose one of these talking pieces and I was like why is there more than one why why do you have seven like that that doesn't sound you know in my mind I'm like this is weird um, but that was again in the times where I was like oh no that's not what that's not what I've learned like that was my whole mantra at the time but then um, when so when I came to alternatives I had that in my in my memory, right? That was part of my memory bank. Like, I am not using a teddy bear <laughs> to be a talking mm. piece at a school. Like, that was real for me. And I remember, um, so then it was, I don't know, when was it at the time or later? Um, I, I remember visiting my friend Karina in um, California, in uh, Oakland. And Pat was already living out that way. She was in San Francisco. And I, we invited her over for dinner. Um, and 
I don't know if it was that conversation, but I remember her explaining the reason why something like a teddy bear was used in the schools and it was to make it more acceptable to do the practice. But David, like that is why it remind it triggers me or it triggered me at the time because it reminded me of how indigenous people have had to hide their symbolism behind Catholicism, Catholic symbols mm. and how we've always had to like you know, make it pass under the table to at least get it in, you know, like get the proposal yeah. in and hide it. But um, so when I came into alternatives, I remember one of my questions at the interview was like, do you, are you guys going to make me do some kind of curriculum? <laughs> I think I said something like that. And um, the person that, the people that interviewed me, they were like, no, we don't have a curriculum. We let people come in with their style. But they also said they were looking for somebody that had knowledge of indigenous based restored, the roots of indigenous, um, the indigenous roots of restorative practice. So I'm like, how much are they really gonna let me come in with um, with what I know, right? So- uh, You took your crew to Pine Ridge. So that was after a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of sweat and tears. Um, but it was amazing because even though, even the staff, um, it, it was its own challenge to like allow for me to allow myself to be seen for who I am. And, um, I was very guarded. I felt like around the staff cause I felt like not everybody necessarily mm, accepted or, even in some ways believed in what I knew. And so folks there were very much, um, they were all well-versed in K Pranis and, you know, trained by Cheryl or Aura. And it was funny because I knew Cheryl and Aura and I was like, okay, that's all right. And then I remember them, this is kind of where I almost, no, wasn't Swick, but, there was one time I said at Southwest Youth when we were asked to come in and do an intervention at a high school, at my old high school, Bogan. Um, and it was Ed, Edward, who was the director of restorative, the, the RJ stuff um, at the time. And there was me and Baradaji, who we were the folks working at SWIC. Um, and we were like the RJ folks. So the principal and the vice principal were like, had a choice. Do they want me and Baradaji, the, you know, um, sage burning and, you know, African uh, teacher looking, or do they want this Edward person from CPS, very respected, very, you know, um, they had just seen both of us like intervene just the initial circle and the vice principal asked us like where did we get our training edward said you know i'm I, I i kid you not he said i'm bona fide certified rj practitioner and i'm like what does that mean and she comes and asks us and we were like i said i was trained in front of a fire in pine ridge south dakota and she was like what but she chose us because she saw what we did um, in that orientation meeting. She saw how we, how the folks responded to us um, as we tried to calm the tension that was in the room. So forward, fast forward to alternatives. Um, it was quite a bit of work that I felt like um, a lot of relationship building, a lot of mutual learning and understanding and I think a turning point, you know, like for, so my year, my first year as the coach going into the schools, that was the only time I was actually doing the, the um, frontline work uh, was like the first year I was there and there was nobody there with me. So I brought in my tools um, and I loved how... I loved learning about how I could 
make it more accessible to be present without kids feeling like this is something religious or so I, I I was exploring that actually I don't need the teddy bear I don't need the other things because I did question like am I going to be able to do it this way um, but here I have like Tomas who's been doing it in schools and then Adan who's also you know been doing it in schools more than I had so I was like I've always done it in community settings, um, but I had my challenges too because in the after school program, I once had like um, uh, a mother of Palestinian family. Um, they were Muslim, and the mother came up to me and said, "We can't do um, circles because it's it's not our religion." And I go, "Oh, it's not a religion." I said, "We're just talking and sharing our feelings." So she said, "Okay, well, we can't touch the feather." I said, okay, that's fine. So, you know, like all of that, I have to bring to alternatives to understand, like, this is where I have to really learn, right? Like what's, what, what can I do without losing my own integrity and without offending others or, or making others lose their integrity because they feel like they have to believe in something else. So, so it was challenging, um, not just at the schools, because I think I feel like the students and the teachers were not as closed to what I was doing. I felt like sometimes the staff was a little more mm, doubtful of what I was doing or what I knew. Um, but when I became manager, I was able to give some, bring some more understanding around the roots of that. And that trip to South Dakota, thanks to um, our host, Jimena, uh, she like allowed us, she, she was the one who really paved the way to, for us to come into the Little Wound School, which is uh, from K all the way to high school. Um, and my only, my only purpose for that was to just expose them to that this is not book center this is actually people live this way with all of its hardship with amidst all of the hardship i should say and um you know they all have their own way of expressing like how they learned from that trip um you know we all want to go back <laughs> we all want to go back as a group um you know now now is definitely not the time but but I think um, folks have found their own way of bringing that experience to to their own practice. I'm reflecting on how personally, like this is a conversation that um, going into work in alternatives, I wish I had had, um, or, and like this perspective, and you might not have been able to give it at that time, right? There's something about how showing up as your authentic self is like really scary um mm -hmm. and it takes time to build that trust with folks to be able to do that um and when you feel like you can get to that point like really beautiful things can happen um was there anything that you can point to that was like this is when i feel safe to be myself here yes um it's it's kind of funny. I don't think I've had this conversation with folks from alternatives, which I would love to. Um, but I remember, so I had just, I had gone, I think that week or something. Um, Kay Pranis was in town and there was a big gathering. I think it was at Roosevelt, I don't remember. But I went down there, it was the first time I had met her. You know, I went in there with like, okay, let me, let me see what this white woman is about because that's how I came in um, thinking. And I had seen the, the curriculum, like alternatives had several copies of um, building, what was it? Circle Forward? Circle Forward, yeah. Circle Forward. Um, so they had that. And that was like their their guidebook you know what they would bring in a lot in, in so many ways and a lot of her books right they use that as their 
their grounding for their practices and uh so i go in i meet her and i was like okay but i didn't know then later um michael uh or one of the staff he was like can i please you can we bring kate pranis to alternatives can she do a training here and i was like yeah sure so um he got all the uh, information like how much you know we were going to be able to give her or how much she was requesting so got it passed all of that we scheduled a whole day for her to come and uh i made sure so i was already manager at the time so i made sure that like we're going to start in the garden greeting the four directions we're starting in the morning and this is what we're going to do and um you know we had food for the you know we had food ordered the the rest of it was really her she, however it is that she runs like her training um which i didn't think it was a training per se i think she literally had a circle and talked about people were able to ask her questions and she talked um gave a lot of knowledge and information around um good practice right so we come back in or we were outside i made sure as we're taught like if there's somebody if there's an elder in the room you you always ask them to like offer one of the directions and so asked her to do the north and then come back in sit down and i think every we were like um i think we were just one big circle but she uh before she started um, she said thank you and all of that and then she's like okay before I begin she turned and she looked at me and said in which direction do your people pass mm -hmm. to the right or to the left and I felt for me after that um, her unfortunately and fortunately but her acknowledgement in the room not knowing the conflict that was happening that I felt um, was happening with how I was being seen as the manager, um, how, you know, like, I mean, it wasn't something that wasn't reparable. It was just, it was pretty natural conflict. Like I was staff and then I became manager of all my peers. And so was, there was that. And then there was, I believe for me, um, this is my my truth is there was this doubting of what did I really know um, that's just how I felt so I felt in, in when she did that I felt like that shifted things it shifted things um, in a way where she was she gave she made herself to be an example of her teaching like she taught by example and she said we always have to make sure we know who's in the room because you never know when you're going to offend somebody and if it's not your practice like you you check and make sure right and um and that's so true because oftentimes we go in the room and we think we are the experts and the only ones that know this and there's some, probably somebody in the room that knows something and um you want to acknowledge that right so she um i think that moment to, for me was i made like a personal uh aware made myself personally aware that there's no way i'm not going back i'm not stepping back from moving forward with uh ex more further ex um exposure to culture culturally rooted um and traditional things and i thought it was great it was a great moment for all of us everybody took away something for themselves with having k Pranis there and i think for me it was um i also felt like i i'm glad i had a chance to meet her she wasn't you know, I was able to lay down my guard of, you know, doubting or not trusting that she was not one of those people that does do harm 
right to colonizing this work right right and so i was like okay you know um so that that helped me also to uh be more be more open um but yeah i think that was a moment for me like one of the strongest moments to for me to feel like yeah i'm i'm gonna be me you're no longer at alternatives um no. what is the work that you're doing now and how are you bringing restorative justice into it oh man um i currently work with an amazing community of folks um at the w haywood burns institute which they are um, home base is in oakland um and folks part of the team are all over the country we're in different parts of the country um, the Burns Institute, it, so one, our namesake is um, after W. Haywood Burns, who is, uh, was a civil rights attorney. He had an unfortunate accident and um, was killed in um, South Africa. Um, don't ask me years, I've never been good <laughs> with the years, but um, he was a great mentor of um, our president, our founder of the actual organization, which is James Bell. Um, and even though the founders were like law-based, you know, lawyer-based, lawyer-centered, that has everything to do with um, the direction and the impetus of uh, the, the way we do our justice, like the just the attack on um, attacking justice uh, pe um, people of color. So we, it started with mostly, you know, um, going after jurisdictions um, that were incarcerating, young, well, that had horrible conditions of confinement or young people of color um, or young people. And uh, so from there it grew into, um, we say, you know, we're trying to, some, some would say, some of us would say eradicate the incarceration of young people. Some will say um, decreasing the racial and ethnic disparities of the incarceration of young people. What do you so say? it depends on who you talk to. What do you to. say? Um, I think you, you, wherever you need to start to get to the end goal, and I would say to end incarceration of young people. Um, but we're also doing a lot of work with um formerly incarcerated adults. So trying to end, trying to uh, definitely decrease the racial ethnic disparities in the incarceration of adults. Um, we work in counties and jurisdictions all over the country. We literally work with whether it like probation, um, detention centers, lawyers, judges, uh, well, not lawyers, uh, police, judges, all of them uh, and community. So part of a big part of that is Community Justice Network for Youth, which is a part of my history as well as um, part during my time at Southwest Youth Collaborative. Um, I learned, well, even before then, because I had already met YSS while I was at Aspira and there was a, um, YSS was doing these cultural exchanges at Pine Ridge. I was invited by Jeremy LaHood, who was at Southwest Youth Collaborative, whom I met in college because of Pablo, who was one of my friends in college. Like, I'm telling you, that's why this network just like cast even greater. Um, so they invited me to participate as a poet and we went down to Pine Ridge to just exchange. Um, there's a huge hip hop presence um, in native, in Indian country, as they call it, in native uh, with native folks and so we wanted to just give have space have some cultural you know hip-hop space and you young people shared with them you know with us uh we had b-boys and b-girls we took djs we had um graph writers graph artists um and so it was a great experience but that's where i met shaka at the time who is currently or who was recently our CEO, but he was the one that started CGNY. So I had met him at the time, and then while I was at SWIC, um, I think I was uh, still in the loop of CGNY stuff, 
but w I didn't get involved until um, as an actual ally. I was invited to a meeting by Matilda. And um, after that, I met the person who um, hired me, my former boss, Tracy. And um, they kind of uh, recruited me from alternatives, uh, which was at a very good time of transition for me. Uh, when you feel like you can't give any more to a place, you you know, it's okay to move on. Um, and so we, currently I do work with um, Mississippi Band of Choctaw um, Indians and doing like also decreasing or reducing or eliminating the incarceration of the young people that they have um, in their system. And then we do... Um, I'm doing beginning to do some work with Lake County here in Illinois, so that's pretty fascinating. Um, so just you know, plugging myself into uh, hopefully, you know, there's lots of work. The Burns Institute does work with LA. LA is currently um, they are working on eliminating their probation department and creating a youth, youth development department. I want to see how that looks. So there's amazing work happening um, at the BI, what we call it the BI for short, and I'm able to bring my whole self, and it has brought on its its greatness, and it has brought on also like all the things that happen when you're getting to know somebody new. So um, somebody recently pointed out, uh, we do a lot of circle style stuff, like we huddle every week, um, and then when we meet, like we check in before we have meetings, we do check-ins, um, which I think is very different than what any other space I've been doing, maybe except for Southwest youth. Um, but I think that's how I feel more at home is because there has been a lot more opportunity to be creative with not just being, um, a linear place to work at, but a place for community um, and all that messiness that community is. Um, yeah, so that's, it's not the, I've always been on the prevention side, I think with the youth work. And now I feel like this is like the intervention side. Um, I think my youth work prepared me, has really prepared me for coming in to help folks understand the harm that incarceration does to young people. So that's a little bit of how I bring that. And to be able to have those conversations, um, the skill around restorative practices, the skills um, help me be able to sit and talk with people, judges and D, you know, DAs and all those folks. Like it's, it's been quite an amazing experience. Yeah. One of the things that you had shared with me the last time we spoke uh, about your work with the Mississippi Band of Choctaws is like the the place that you find yourself one being an outsider to the community um, knowing something about indigenous ways and working with people um, who themselves in a lot of ways want to rely on the carceral system mm -hmm. how do you how have you been navigating that so um, unfortunately I feel like Native folks um, have been subjected to the imposition of the United States systems and um, people have come in to help set up these systems that are not Native, right? People mm -hmm. that are not Native have come onto the reservation to help set up these systems. Now, Mississippi Band of Choctaw is um, not probably the only one, but is very unique in the sense that they do have their um, their own court, which is the peacemaking court, um, and I think I think now um, just after the community having more conversations with the greater community and the folks that are working as part of the system, because here's the difference: like here on on our end, you know, outside of a reservation, a Native American reservation. We see each other as like, if you're a person of color and you work for the system, you're one of them. It's like them versus us. Mm -hmm. 
What I see happening with Mississippi Vanna Choctaw is I always hear them say, we, like, we Choctaw, we as Choctaw, like, they don't separate themselves because they work as this or that. Um, and I think that is, um, even in their way, <laughs> even in their way if, of the positions that they have, like, their relationship with with the, with each other is nothing like what we see at all. Like, you walk into the detention center and you're not treated like a criminal. Like, you walk into the juvenile hall here and it's like, you better move or you're going to get searched, right? And over there, it's your people. Like, people are treated as, as people. Um, the system itself, I think... You know, I'm not going to get into the minds of why. All I know is historically, like, these systems were imposed upon Native people. And I think in their own way, they're, they're going to make it work with what they know is best for them. I think we need to, um, the way to navigate, the way I've learned to navigate is I'm not there to tell them what is best for them. However, what, what we can do is be think partners in what changes they see they want to make. And um, we can help be a resource by giving, giving information from other places and connecting them to other places. Um, just like we actually had, um, I hosted a peer exchange and I brought somebody from Mississippi and somebody from South Dakota, um, Eric Brings White, brought him down. He's over at Rapid City, but he's Lakota and brought them down to Chicago. So they met with um, folks, different folks from Chicago, not everybody, but they met with the, you know, circles and ciphers and folks from urban life skills um, to give them ideas about the things that they already do and how else they wanna like improve on what they already do. And I think that's really important because too many times outsiders come into um, to reservations or native communities and all we want to do is tell them what to do and we can't like we've been telling them what to do since this government started since the pilgrims landed since Christopher Columbus came over to this side of the world and um, that's not our role so I think uh, the Burns Institute is very conscious of that in our in our practice of um, working with native folks and we definitely um stand on like being a resource um, being a think partner and uh having good practice in uh supporting right native people to be um their own determinant determinants of themselves and where they want to see their justice we're back with Helen Thomas, one of the previous guests on this podcast, to talk about the upcoming Decolonize and Indigenize Your Classroom workshop series she's hosting. Uh, welcome, Helen. Uh, tell us a little bit about what people are going to experience and learn uh, in these workshops. In this workshop series, it's a Decolonizing and Indigenizing Your Classroom series. So we are going to be covering topics like settler colonialism, Indigenous erasure and curriculum, affirming Indigenous sovereignty, learning uh, from Indigenous knowledge. And first workshop is on naming settler colonialism in schools, which I think is a really important topic to start with so that we can frame our understanding of why we see Indigenous erasure, uh, why we don't learn about Indigenous sovereignty. Uh, so we're going to start with that topic and then move on to the other ones where we're not just looking at this from a deficit mindset, but really able to discuss and learn how to work with Indigenous people. Um, but the other part of what people are gonna experience in this workshop is being able to learn and grow in community with other educators who are committed to decolonizing and indigenizing their practice. Our team at Decolonize Your Classroom acknowledges that we all were educated within this system that perpetuates and upholds 
settler colonialism. So the idea of engaging in an anti-colonial practice in the classroom can seem really overwhelming or like you're not sure where to start. So we're hoping that by doing this learning in community um, through small group discussions in breakout rooms and community building activities, we'll be able to create um, more sustainable change towards decolonizing and indigenizing classrooms. And you can find so much more about these workshops in the show notes, so we'll have the link to where you can sign up. Thank you so much, Ellen. Thank you, Pilama Yaye, for having me. I'm curious, like, how the Institute got to that place, or is that just where they started? Because not all, because not a lot of nonprofits take that stance. Yeah, and believe it or not, like, that's, that's actually something that it's exactly what you said, like, you don't see it everywhere. So I can't say I know all of the roots. Mm -hmm. I know that our founder, James Bell, has developed over time since however long he's been doing his practice of law, has developed strong relationships with um, different folks from the Native community across the country. And um, I want to say Shaka going into... um, his experiences in as part of the BI, but him going into uh, these cultural exchanges with YSS in South Dakota, all of that helped frame um, this very respectful understanding of um, how we want to go about even, you know, like the, the contracts we got were through the, um, through a foundation who, uh, we were doing certain a certain kind of work with, um, but now that like necessarily that foundation we know will not always be there, the Burns Institute knows that we want to be a think partner with Native communities. And so actually currently we're working on um, gathering some folks. We have ta- have, sev- have had several conversations with some folks um, that are, uh, we identify as leaders across the country and we'll be having more conversations to see if folks want to come together and as like a some kind of network um, to to address the incarceration of Native youth um, in the United States. Because it's not just happening on the reservation, it's happening, you know, um, there's a big issue with U.S. when the state has a Native youth, they don't report it to the reservation to let them know they have one of their youth, which is actually a law that they have that mm-hmm. the U.S. Mm-hmm. has to abide by, but doesn't always do so. So the the Burns Institute, um, I think, has just uh, over time. This has been a very conscious choice of like, if we're gonna work with Native folks in Indian Country, then we're going to we're going to be very respectful. Um, we have to know our place. Like we're not there to tell them. Um, what to do and how to do it and so I think uh, I can't say I know if anything specifically happened all I know is it was there when I started I started with them a little over three years ago and I find that for me is um, I feel like that's pretty legit Uh, I don't have any um, as far as the way they've been carrying themselves um, I, I have a lot, a lot of respect for the work that they've done thus far. Yeah, yeah. I like one of the things I think about when doing restorative work are like values, right? And like this value of um, self determination, like, like acknowledging that people know what's best for them, right, is mm-hmm. something that's really important for me, especially. I I especially think about it when I'm doing training, like not trying to come in and train people who don't want this work, <laughs> right? Um, right. Um, I'm curious if there's a value in this work broadly that is really important for you as you move through this work and how it shows up. Yeah, I think we definitely um, carry that as a value, um, just even in our relationship with one another, as part of the organization. Um, Sometimes it may not, like, sometimes we're all in our feelings and maybe we don't see that, but um, I personally feel like the organization holds up pretty strongly um, a respect for people's personal um, lived experience. Um, We have folks that 
are formerly incarcerated that are staff mm-hmm. and leading some of the work, which I think, um, you know, if, if that's able to flourish more um, and develop more, like, that's exactly who needs to be leading. Like, we have a firm belief in those closest to the problem or have been impacted by the problem yeah. are the ones who know what what they need. And so what better way to practice that than to um, essentially and ultimately put them, if they choose, to be those leaders, right? Because we also have this terrible thinking of, um, you know, like for youth, like, oh, well, you're a young person. You should be a leader with that if you don't prepare them, right? So, and if they don't want to, then you don't make them be those leaders. So I think for me, like I see that as part of um, lots of conversations we've had um, in the organization. And I just think that that's, that feels right for me. Um, I don't think any place is ever perfect. I would hope not. I hope that there's always place to grow, a place to grow and learn from. Um, And right now I feel, you know, the Burns Institute has had has had its growth edges. Will continue to have its growth edges, uh, but I think definitely um, is a is a strong strong example for me of like a place that can really be transformational in its uh, how it holds its values and how it like applies its values in in treating its staff and doing its work. Yeah, that's important for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how do you want to continue to grow in this work? I want to be able to be there, um, be present for folks. Um, and I want to be able to, I want to be able to, um, not necessarily be, um, how do I put it? Like, Sometimes people, and you might know, but like if they see that you're somebody that does, oh, you're an RJ person, um, people assume that you're always on. <laughs> the, the, your sign is always on, your neon open sign. And so you are always available to respond to a crisis or to participate in something. So I want to be able to grow in being able to support people and um, not feel like I have to be the one putting out the fire. Mm. I feel like I still am not mature enough in that way. And I have to pay more attention to those that I see are. Um, And I think that's not telling people, turning people away. I think it's, you're actually can probably be a better resource when you're not the one putting out the fire and like, but instead building, helping build someone else's capacity, but not necessarily having to be their trainer or like, um, yeah, that's how I want to grow. I need to be more mature. Yeah. What does that that look like? Because for me, what I think about is, um, because uh, Amplify RJ has a platform that has, people do reach out um, and I don't have the capacity, but I also don't know like really who to direct them to, especially like now when people are reaching out from like from a place of like having no relationship with me, right? Um, yeah, how, what does that look like for you? I think especially when it comes to people you care about, like there's a fine line of... Um helping people and then being codependent Mm -hmm. right and so just because just like um just because you're in a capacity to it uh, uh, of a certain practice like doesn't mean one it doesn't mean you have it all figured out um we have our own stuff that we have to deal with right so what it would look like for me is just being able to say enough or share enough of whatever's being asked um, without feeling like I have to book like a bunch of sessions or time like um, like just being able because I think if somebody keeps looking for you maybe you weren't um, you weren't as good a resource the first time 
And then learning, like, maybe I'm not that resource. Maybe I'm not that person. And I need to stop thinking that I can help you because I probably can't. If you keep coming back, then maybe I'm not giving you what you actually need. Um, so discerning that, that, that's part of what it looks like for me is how to discern that. I mean, that maybe that's playing into your ego. Like, you know, like, oh, but I want to be the person that people mm -hmm. look for. Um, but again, like, like you, I don't have the capacity all the time. And not that everybody's knocking on my door, but I, I do know, like, I do struggle when it does happen. Like, even with family, um, that's probably a big thing is how to say, um, not how to say no, but how to say not right now or not that much, or I don't know what it is. But there's, I've seen people do it and they do it really well and I want to learn. <laughs> I want to be able to do that too. Um, but I know my, um, I tend to be around a lot for my family and I think sometimes to a fault. Mm -hmm. Sometimes to a fault. And I need to learn how to set my boundaries. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for. Set my boundaries. For sure. I was going to say, like, circling back to you, you know, your who are you, you are Sandra to the fullest capacity of what Sandra means. <laughs> um, and that comes with, like, some amazing things and some challenging things, right? Wanting to be there for people and, like, drawing the line. So, like, I think boundaries is, like, a really good way of putting that. Uh, we've mm -hmm. come to the point where I ask the rapid fire questions where they're meant to be short answers, but I often have follow up questions. So, um, <laughs> Restorative justice is a way of life that takes a lot of practice every day. Yeah. What is one place or situation you wish people really knew this work? In the higher places of government. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <clears throat> you get to sit in circle with four people dead or alive. Who are they and what do you talk oh. about? Damn. Um, okay. I'm going to say my grandmother, my tita, Malcolm X. Um, Netzahualcoyot, who is a poet of um, pre-conquer, -con pre pre-invasion times. An amazing poet. Um, Yogi Parahamsa. I read his book and that book helped me to understand a whole different meaning about love for self. Those would be the four people. And what would you talk about? Oh man. <laughs> um, spirituality for sure. Um, uh, yeah. And just, you know, survival or like living, you know, how, how to be, how to live. I think they all have experienced life um, very, in, in some very similar ways philosophically and um, but also have a lot of things that I could learn from differently um, what is one thing you wish everyone listening to this podcast would know that we only know what we know that's it we only know what we as an individual know and that's the only thing we can um we can say is true we can't can't tell other people what they know or what they don't know why is that important um because the more we stop meddling with um other people and how they live their life and what they know um which is really hard to do in these days <laughs> this day and age um but the more we stop getting involved like that, the more we learn how to focus on getting involved with ourselves and what we know and, and how to improve ourselves without, 
you know, as, as opposed to always being involved with how other people need to improve themselves. What if it's like, wear a mask? <laughs> Just wear the mask. <laughs> um, yeah, my uh, duality doesn't, doesn't agree um, with the mask wearing practice. And for me, I feel like it doesn't take anything away from me. It doesn't take, it doesn't hurt me. It doesn't, you know, um, everyone has their political reason. So I live in a home with ha with some contradictory beliefs <laughs> and uh, I'm working through that. But I feel like I have to do what, what I feel is good for me and we'll have conversations about it or we won't. But, um, but that's what I know is good for me. I can't tell someone else, it, you know, you want to get involved, but you have to like stop yourself. Mm -hmm. you know kind of slap your own hand away like look don't don't tell other people on the street to wear their mask <laughs> that might cost you your life <laughs> for sure for sure and well i think like where that comes into tension for me is that like you know we are interconnected and like what we do does have an effect on some on other people and you know staying in your lane and like, i know that's not what you said um, but like knowing what you know, um, can have like ripple effects, whether or not like you do choose to say something or not. And everybody, we all have to like, you're going to deal with the consequences of your actions or your words in the way that you see fit or the way that you feel it happens to you. Right. And the, uh, the way I'm going to deal with it with me, um, it's not easy. So let let me be clear. Yeah. It's not easy to do any of any of it. It's not easy to only know what you know and not get involved with others, especially people you love, you care about, you think you know what's best. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't care. Um, but in terms of like this practice of like wearing the mask, um, for me, it's just like, I don't know enough to debate it, debate the science, debate the energy part of it, debate the spiritual part of it. I just know um, what I see around me and I know people are sick. I know people that I know that their family members got, you know, I know my family members have got sick. And so I know enough for me that makes me feel this is something that I choose to practice. Mm -hmm. um, who is one person that I should have on the podcast? And before you answer, you've got to help me get them on. Oh, man. <laughs> um, who is someone you should have on the podcast? I think you should have Adan on or Frank Blasquez. Frank Blasquez would be in New Mexico. I'm sure he would be. Him or, or Lou, they'll probably be on together, him and his duality, um, Lou Blaskis. But um, they will, and Adan, um, they were founders of YSS and they're my uncle and auntie. Um, Adan, because he's been doing this um, in schools in his own way for a long time. For sure. Um, we'll be looking, I'll be looking forward to those introductions. <laughs> And you sure will. Uh, last thing, um, how can people support you, your work, in the ways that you want to be supported? Mm, the way to support me and my work is, um, I think one way is to support your podcast and your entrepreneurship um, because um, we are related, right? We, uh, what you do affects me. Um, so I hope that you are successful and the only way for you to be successful is for people to support you and now that I know I'm going to support you um and I think if you you know the way I see it is like I think about how do I honor the people that have shared things with me and have taught me things and it's just every day is trying to be our best self and don't beat yourself up if you mess up just recalibrate and get back into it um so 
I think supporting the work is um, improving, working on ourselves first. I learned that from, um, for sure, learned that um, through, thanks to the Lakota traditions and Ed Young Man Afraid of His Horses, who was our elder and invited us into his home and onto his land. And Kyle, South Dakota, and who was the person that, um, unbeknownst to him, right, he probably didn't know that he was going to impact so many of us here in Chicago and probably different people around the world, but that he um, taught us, like, by example, first work on yourself. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Sandra, for being with me this morning. So much to reflect on. Um, and I know we're going to have a short follow-up conversation after this, so I'm kind of like really anxious to get to that. So for everyone else, um, thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another podcast. Until then, take care. Like what you heard? Please subscribe, rate, review, and share this podcast on whatever platform you're using right now. It really helps us further amplify this work. You can also support us by following us on our social platforms, signing up for our email list, rocking our new merch, joining our Patreon, or signing up for a workshop. So many options! Links to everything in the show notes and on our website, AmplifyRJ.com. Thanks so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week.